the Chamber and those online for the 20th of July, and we're in the Green Genoma. And the first thing I want to do is take any apologies. I'm not seeing any indications of apologies, so. Mary McGarty, okay. No others? Okay, thank you. Then we're going to sign the minutes of the meeting of the um, 22nd of June. Any declarations of interest? None being indicated? Okay. And then any matters arising? No, just page one. Okay, we're going to go on then. Uh, so I'm going to bring Martin in just at this point and wants to. Uh, okay, members. Um, hold on, just one me second, Martin, here till we get my mouse to cooperate with me here. There we go. Um, okay, members, um, good afternoon. Um, firstly, um, paper B, Appendix 1. LA 10 2022 0206 for Jerry and Anne Monteith for two detached dwellings at 1 to 7 Gargam Road. Bitna has now been withdrawn. Um, the council have worked with the agent and we've identified an alternative site, but it would require a new plan application. So they're working towards that. So that's not on the, that's not on the agenda today. Okay, members. Young Barry. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just to welcome the fact that officers have been working with the Monteith family to identify possible solutions, and that seems to be the best way forward. Thank you. Okay. Aaron. Thank you again, Chair, and thank the officer uh, for his information there on that one. Uh, I think, as we've said before in this committee, uh, when we get the difficult decisions to make, and if we can work with our planning officers, our agents, and our applicants, and so much the better. It's not in our interest to turn anyone down, but we, we have to work within our rules, and if people can work in a cohesive manner together, so much the better. So thanks for letting me in there, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Cheers, sir. Okay. We're going to move on then to um, consider a file for decision by the Planning Committee, and that's Paper A. And that's application LA 10 2021 okay. um, So the first uh, application is LA 10 2021. Sorry. Just hit your button there. There you go. It's me now. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so application um, number one is LA 10 2021 0916. So this is an amendment to um, nine number of wind turbines associated and associated infrastructure um, at Pigeon Top Wind Farm. Um, the proposal is to increase the tip height to 142.5 metres and also include a new 80 metre met mast. Um, as I said, the land is located at Cornavara Road and it's part of the Pigeon Top Wind Farm approval. Um, the recommendation is to approve planning permission. Okay, members, um, the site or the, the map um, on the screen identifies the site. So the site will be as known at the moment as Cornavara Wind Farm. So this is located between Drumquin and Oma. So at the moment, there is an existing wind farm already um, operational. And, and the proposal now um, 
includes an additional nine turbines to be located within this site. Now, it should be noted that both wind farms were actually approved historically together, um, but it just so happens that Corn of Arrow Wind Farm has been constructed first. This is the second wind farm, and, and the difference between this and the previous application is that there's been an increase in its turbine height. Okay, so here's a quick breakdown of the history. Um, you'll see that in 2009, it was first approved by the Planned Appeals Commission. Um, a subsequent application in 2011 to the, the department increased its uh, tip height to 126.5 metres. Um, there's been a few other applications as well for further infrastructure. In 2015, um, development commenced on this site um, from the original 2011 permission. Okay, members, so the last uh, approved uh, wind farm had a, a tip height of, of, of turbine up to 126 metres. Um, you can see it on the screen. The, the latest turbine is 142.5 metres. Now, this is a common uh, increase in height that we have seen across a number of uh, different wind farms recently. Um, we've presented a few wind farms in the last year or so, which have had similar increases. Um, to 142.5. So the block plan in front of you um, shows you the, the wind farm as proposed. Now the red dots are actually the Corn Navarro wind farm. Each one of them red dots has a wind, uh, wind turbine actually constructed and is operational. So you can see the infrastructure to the top and to the bottom. So to the top there's five turbines proposed and to the, to, to the bottom of that side there's four. And that's how the Pigeon Top Wind Farm will integrate with the Corn Navarro Wind Farm. So this is an example of the previously approved block plan. So you can see that it's a very similar layout. In fact, it's exactly the same. So turbines will be located in the same places as they were previously approved, with the only difference being the height increase. So in terms of critical viewpoints, um, as most people will, will, will identify along the main um, Dromore to Omer Road, the existing wind farm at Pigeon Top is, uh, is visible. So um, the first montage at the top actually shows um, the integration of the existing wind farm with the proposed Pigeon Top wind farm at 126 metres. And that bunch that is circled in red um, shows just a cluster of turbines from that view of the mini burns. Now, if you go down to the second image, that's the same image, except these turbines are now 142.5 metres in height. So you can see it's very difficult to actually um, identify the, the increase in height over such a large period. Um, and again, the bottom slide, it shows a wireframe, and you can see the two wind farms together. Um, so Pigeon Top is, might be hard to identify here, but Pigeon Top is identified in blue with Corn of Arrow Wind Farm in purple. Again, you can see the height difference between the turbines um, that was approved and the existing turbines, they're all very similar. Uh, the next critical viewpoint um, I would, uh, that we would identify as being very important is the part in Drum Quinn towards Oma. Um, so at the moment, you can see um, the Cornavara wind farm very clearly. So basically, that cluster that we see at the moment will be filled in with more turbines of a similar height and size. Uh, further along that stretch of road, um, this image shows you the existing Cornavara wind farm. And just to show how that landscape will be filled in with additional turbines, um, the box in blue shows where the pigeon top turbines will be located. Again, as I said before, they've already been approved. They've already been commenced in terms of um, what we require commencement of development. They just haven't been constructed. And this site, or uh, this particular slide shows some archaeological sites within the area. Um, and again, um, there's no impacts on these. And you'll see from the report that um, there's there, there's no issues in terms of archaeological issues. So the recommendation is to approve plan permission um, subject to the 15 conditions as outlined within within the report. 
Okay, thanks very much, Martin. We have representation by the applicant, Ms. Anya Havner. And Anya should be with us. Can you hear us? Hi there. Uh, can Hi you there. Hear me? How are you? I'm good, thanks. Can you see me? Yes, we can see you and hear you. So uh, you me. have 10 minutes. Well, um, I suppose I just want to clarify that the intention was that we would be present, that I am present to answer any queries that are raised. Essentially, we've we are in, we're proposing the development and we've reviewed the the uh, planning officer's report. So we're very much um, in support of the arguments that are put forward there. Um, so um, um, essentially, like there, there are no objections to the development. The, the statutory consultees have responded and there's no issue there. There are no third party objections. And um, the local plan officers also recommend a plan approval. As far as we can see, the planning balance would be overwhelmingly in favor of this application. So we would respectfully request that the planning committee um, would agree with the, the planning officer's determination. Okay. So otherwise, if anybody has questions, I'll be here. Okay. And We'll move to that point now, members, if anybody has any questions. And we have John, first question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, by increasing the, the size, it, it, obviously it would be better if we have less turbines but producing more. So we're, we're changing the, 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 the height by 10 metres, which is obviously raising the tip of the... Uh, the blade, so that's increasing the the, the area that the, that the I know I know mathematically how to do it, and if I had enough time, I probably could do it myself. But what is the actual increase in size of the blades going round, and what is the increase in output by that ten meter change change in in compared to what they had originally asked for in the planning? Because I'm assuming that's that's what this will do. It will make it more efficient and produce more electric, I'm hoping, anyway. Anya, yeah, do so you want to? Um, yeah, so just to clarify, the increase in tip height will be 16 metres over that which was approved. And um, so the length of the blades will extend to 58.5 metres, and that will result in an output from the development of around 92,000 megawatt hours. So with comparison to the approval, that's an additional 30,525 megawatts above the Pigeon Top Wind Farm as it was already approved. So that's equivalent to the energy consumption of around 21,000 homes per year. Um, so it would be a significant additional um, output from, from the site area, um, the wind energy flowing over the Pigeon Top site area. Okay, John. Cheers, Robert. Yep, uh, I'm not sure if this has to be directed more at Martin rather than on you, but uh, just uh, on you, one for clarification. This application in regard to, I suppose, is split into two. One is looking to seek permission, which is going for an approval for additional nine uh, turbines, but it's also on the back of that increasing the lifespan from 20 to 25 years. Okay. Uh, that's exactly it. I just want clarification. The second part in regard to the lifespan of the turbines only relates to this application, not any of those uh, turbines that are on site currently. I'm not sure. Well, you could clarify that yeah, on you, but uh, that's, yeah. So that's that is the case. So this is only for this particular wind farm, Pigeon Top, in front of us. That, that's okay. Thousand. Well, I have questions for you afterwards, so I'll, I'll go out of this then and come back, Martin. Thanks. No other questions, guys? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Shania. That is all the questions that we have there. So we're going to uh, move on then to the members to be it here. Robert? Yeah. 
Thanks, Chair uh, Tommy. Uh, this is more a, a matter of policy and it's policy clarification. Uh, it's got absolutely nothing, but it is directly aligned to the application. Um, this application seeks to get a further nine um, turbines, which is fair enough, in an existing cluster, which is clustered around. Um, piggybacking on that is the extension, basically, not the extension. It's taking the lifespan of the uh, turbines from 25 to 35 years. In my view, that's a major policy shift. And I'm not sure whether at this stage we have fully considered the implications of it um, in regard to all wind farms. Because, and it's got nothing to do with you, Anya, this is, in my opinion, a policy. If we shift our stance in regard to lifespan on this one application, this, and it's granted, we're still debating this, that then will become material in regard to any other applications coming in with regard to lifespan extension or indeed new wind farms going on site. I'm not sure whether we have fully considered the implications of that because currently going through the local development plan policy, we've done um, a character analysis with regard to landscape impact and it's also done with renewable. But we've done that in regard to a 25 year lifespan, which is currently the accepted lifespan of all wind farms. The debate that we had going through the local development plan was that at the end of that, a new application should come in and then it should be based on the merits of whether the uh, retention of those wind farms should stick or whether an alteration could happen because essentially we're looking at 20 to 25 years down the line. The, if I can say the environment could have significantly changed and we may have a bigger appetite for doing wind farm, who knows, or there may be adverse implications in regard to that. So I'm just not sure whether I'm completely comfortable here with actually granting uh, this application on a 35-year basis rather than a traditional 25-year basis. Okay. I've got no issues with the application. I have an issues with the lifespan. Thank you. I'd like to hear what Martin says. Cheers, Robert. Yeah. So um, on that, we've actually brought forward an application in October 2021 for a similar lifespan expansion from 25 to 35 years from early that was approved through the planning committee at that stage so we have we have been here and we have done that um, what I would say in terms of the the, the, the ex expansion of time I mean one consideration that, that you would you would have would be are the reports and because this was accompanied by an environmental statement are they are they going to be relevant? between now and, and 35 years as opposed to 25 years. And that's something that the statutory council fees would have considered. You know, that was in front of them. So in this example, they're satisfied in terms of that part of the, of the project, that there will be no impact um, in terms of uh, working in terms of the draft, the draft plan. Now, um, I mean, that's something I wasn't privy to. Paul, perhaps, may, may want to take that. To where we're going there but in terms of the expansion we have done it before and we have at certain examples expanded um wind farms by five years as well over the last number of years may not have been in front of the committee in terms of a major plan application but we have done that okay thanks martin paul did you want to come today yeah um I suppose just to expand slightly on on what Martin said, um, like the current policy for renew renewables uh, sits within the SPPS and PPS eighteen, and that hasn't changed. You know, we would sort of normally on occasion get an application to extend the the one tur turbine life. Um, so it's applications that's been before us. We take each one as 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 we get it and we assess it. Uh, what you'll see within the report is actually um, a consideration of the Fermanagh local development plan and the weight to be attached to those policies. 
And we've actually quoted there the la landscape one, the energy capacity study for Fermanagh and Oma. And at the minute, in terms of, uh, you know, the turbine height, um, there is no conflict. So any applications coming in uh, following this, then we can obviously consider is there any conflict going forward with those applications or in general then the cumulative impact, but those can all be considered and, you know, forthcoming applications that come before us or the committee and we'll be considering, you know, uh, the local development plan and those, those landscape one energy capacity studies within all our applications and going forward. Um, now, just I suppose as a, an additional point, um, I think there was a consultation which the council re uh, replied on in terms of renewable energy, and one of the queries was um, whether uh, the renewable sort of regional renewable policy um, in terms of restricting uh, one turbines to a 25 uh, year limit would remain the case, and and that's still. We had submitted our comments back that we, we had suggested that it should and each application then be considered on its own merits. Um, but that consultation and the review of that regional policy is still ongoing. Um, but members, I, I would see no conflict uh, in approving this application at this point. Okay. Thank you. There's nobody else indicating. So that being the case, members, I'm looking at a decision here. We have a uh, recommend to uh, approve. Paul. I'm oh, sorry, Alan. Well, personally, okay. Well, Chairman, uh, in, in, in the light of the presentation that has been given, and in the light of the clarification that has been given from the, our officers, I'm happy to propose that we accept the recommendation for this uh, proposal. I, per, per, this is personally, I feel that it is a, a much sought after uh, part of, of the, the infrastructure that will be in needed in, in the future. And therefore, I'm delighted to have the opportunity of proposing. Shall I, Paul? I second that proposal. Okay. Then? Already seconded. I'm happy with the recommendation. Thanks, Chairman. There you go. Okay. We all agreed? Martin, now you can. Okay, so the recommendation is to approve the application for the reasons listed within the report and subject to 15 conditions. Um, members have granted plan permission um, subject to those conditions. Okay, John? Yeah, apologies, Chair, for coming late. Uh, I just want to declare that I didn't take part in the decision. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, we're moving on. And thank you very much, Anya. We have now our second uh, paper B was withdrawn there. So we're going to application number two, and that's LA 10 2021 Okay, members. Um, so 210042 is the retention of a single story agricultural building for the use of storage of farm feed and farm machinery. And location is North 140 metres northeast of 17 Darabard Road, Fintana, and the applicant is F. McKnight. Um, the recommendation is to refuse plan permission. Okay, so on the screen in front of you, um, you can see a snippet from the P1C form, which is the form which applicants have to submit whenever they have a case which has any farming credentials. So you can see that the applicant, or that the name of the applicant here was Francis McKnight, um, and that was reps in care of William McKnight. Okay. So they have three parcels of land um, that will be on their DERA number or farm maps. So you can see um, the two portions here. Um, and the third one is the site of the proposal. Okay. So this is a significant map because if you look to the to the bottom left hand corner, 
This is the principal farm house and, 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 and yard, just where the arrow is shown. Then just above that, you can see the way the road, that's the Darabar Road, the way that it meanders um, between the two portions of land. And then on the top, you can see the shed, um, which has uh, got the red box around it. And that uh, X is the location of where this building actually is. Okay, so um, the plan in front of you here, the block plan, actually demonstrates this a little bit easier um, and more visible. So you can see the proposal to the top corner with the yellow star. So that's an existing, that's the shed that has been built. Um, and there's an existing laneway um, which runs all the way down to the public road. And then on the far side of the road with the red star, that is actually the applicant's house. And the buildings located around that are the existing farm buildings. Okay, so here it is again on, on an ortho image. Um, so you can see from the yellow star that that's the building that's been constructed or partly constructed at that stage actually. Um, so on the ground, there's a little bit more there now. Um, the white star, which I haven't mentioned, um, is actually a relative of the applicant. And as you'll have read through the report, they have a connection with the farm. Um, and then obviously the red star uh, is the applicant's home address. All buildings to the north of the screen, so everything that's to the left-hand side of that um, are all third-party properties. Okay, this plan um, actually shows the, a sheep shed, if you, can, if you can see, in between the farm building that's proposed and the uh, and the and the other third part, the other dwelling, sorry, at the bottom of the lane, there's a sheep shed. Um, that sheep shed has been um, there for a period of over seven years, and that's the only agricultural building on that side of the land, on that side of the road, um, that that the applicant actually has apart from the new application. Um, again, this this next plan. Um, shows you the laneway. So that laneway in black, it's existing and it has been there for a considerable period of time. The sheep shed is shown um, halfway along that with a sheep paddock. And then the dwelling at number 17 is, is the other person involved in the farming activity. So the plan here just shows you a quick floor plan of the, of the proposed building. Um, it's approximately 240 square meters. So the right hand side is used for storage and the left hand side is to be used for um, straw and hay storage so for, for fodder for purposes. Um, this plan now shows you the actual building um, that's to be constructed. The building isn't fully constructed at this stage but partly constructed. This is an image of the way it is at the moment. Um, And this is an image of the laneway, which goes down towards that Darabar Road. On the far side of that photograph, just in the very to the rear, you can see um, a hill. That hill is actually on the other side of the Darabar Road, and that's close to where the applicant's house actually is. This image is the sheep paddock, um, which I mentioned, which has been constructed halfway down that lane, which has been there for seven years. And that's an image of it as you go towards the end of the lane. The dwelling on the left hand side or just above that, that is the other dwelling that uh, of the other person involved in this farm farming activity. Okay, so if we go back to the main farm um main farm dwelling or the main dwelling of the of the person involved in, in this in this agricultural activity, um the yellow star indicates the house. Um, you can see behind that there's a number of sheds. Them sheds are currently used for agricultural activity for storage purposes. This image shows the front of that uh, dwelling house. Here's an image to the, to the rear. So that's the first agricultural shed with some, um, with some gates and steel on the ground. This is actually a photograph now of inside that building. So um, you can see its capacity. And this is another photograph of another building alongside that. Again, it's, it's full. 
and the third building has a number of tractors parked on it. Um, now, if you look at the star on the right hand side, this is an area of land, um, which is to the rear of them sheds. And the photograph, obviously, to the left shows you what, what's currently um, used in that portion of land. So we have a fence, some storage to the back of that building, and then mostly used as a grazing field for sheep. So in relation to third party um, objectors, you'll, you'll have noted from the uh, report that there were objections to this application and they've raised quite a number of issues. Um, so just to outline where these third parties are located, as I said previously, so the yellow stars um, are people who aren't involved in this agricultural activity. So you can see their proximity in terms of both the laneway and obviously the agricultural building um, at, the, at the top of the site. In fact, number 11 is within 47.9 metres and number 13 is within 51.6 metres. Now, um, during the processing of the application, obviously planning have gone to all the statutory consultees, um, including environmental health, and they've came back and they are satisfied that there will be no detrimental impact upon these third parties, providing a condition was to be placed on any permission that it would be used only for storage. So based upon that, um, and based upon what the applicant has, uh, has proposed, you can see from the report that the planning department are satisfied despite its proximity to these third parties. Um, now the agent throughout the process of the application supplied um, a number of appendixes. Um, and this one dates back to 2011. So the actual laneway was there. Um, and there was a small area of hard cord um, ground where the building is now. In 2017, the laneway was still there. That hard cord area had been overgrown. The sheep shelter at this stage was located in the middle of that site. Um, by 17, the laneway, had, which had been there, had, had been re reused again in some way. And then by 20, the sheep shed on the start of the yard um, was starting to commence. So again, more information from the agent. Um, as you'll have read through the report, he'll have provided some, he's provided some reasons as to why um, the proposal needs to be located on that side of the road and not beside the principal farm buildings. Um, so he's talking about um, the tight laneway that there is into the existing dwelling. Um, and when you get up to the existing farmyard, that it's a very, very narrow lane and it's not practical that any building could be located on the existing site of the principal farm buildings. So we've shown again a narrow laneway which which goes up alongside the building and the steepness of the ground to the rear. Um, and this building that you can see now in the image, that's the last of the agricultural buildings that they actually have on their own site. And the steepness of the ground to the rear is a reason why the agent is saying that it's not practical to consider building another building to the rear of this. So um, the planning office, officers have recommended um, the proposal for refusal. Um, we believe it's contrary to policy CTY 12 of PPS 21 and that the development is not essential for the efficient functioning of the business um, and there are no demonstrative uh, health and safety reasons for the alternative site away from the existing farm buildings. And the proposal is also contrary to CTUA 1 of policy PPS 21. Um, and coming to those reasons, um, the planning officers um, went through PPS uh, CTUA 12 of PPS 21, which breaks down a number of criteria um, for a new farm building in the countryside. Um, now, Throughout that criteria, it met a number of these, but there's an exceptions test for new development, and it did not meet the exceptions in that um, it, we, it wasn't demonstrated that it was essential for the functioning um, of the business, and it didn't demonstrate that there was no health and safety implications for, for having the building at, at the existing site. Okay. Thanks, Martin. We have uh, speakers on this one, and we have Mr. David McKinley is the agent. Uh, 
Can you hear us, David? I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I uh, can indeed, yes. Lovely. Lovely. You're very welcome. Thank you. You have 10 minutes, so. Thank you. <clears throat> Many thanks, by the way, for last month for deferring the application. I was on holidays, and I really do appreciate the chance to represent Francis on this application. This development has been ongoing since 2011, as, as Martin has said, look, there's been lane races that have been made back in 11, there's been small sheep enclosure, uh, even even the even the, the, the sort of the basis of where the building sits on was already developed at that stage. Um, so it's, it's evident through the application that, that it had commenced in, in part. Uh, the building was erected as an it has been erected as a necessary building to the farm. It is needed. We have demonstrated through the letters submitted to planning service that the existing buildings to the rear of 16 Dairy Bar Road are, are, are full of farm machinery. This is also further confirmed by a site visit planning service a couple of months ago. And I hope the planning department can also confirm that he or she did see the pens and the crushes, etc. within it. I wasn't party to the photographs Martin took. And you can clearly see on, on, on two or three of the photographs, you can see the cattle feeding pens. You can see that the, in particular building E, which is the very top building, shows the crush or shows the pen enclosures for the crush. Uh, this is an operating farm yard that requires machinery to be moved out at certain times of the year to allow Frances the opportunity to lamb her 70 odd, odd sheep. For that to happen, the machinery that was in the very top shade uh, uh, is set out in the open for two months. Look, perhaps to some people, think that, that might not be too bad, but to Frances, I myself, that's unacceptable. The price of machinery uh, and, and the depreciation of their machinery is, is, is key key to the application. Uh, they set out in a risk, and, and even for that, even the length of time that is set out, there's an element of risk of theft. Uh, when, whilst on the other side of the main dairy bar road gives her, where the application is, gives her an opportunity to continually store the machines and a secure compound directly behind and in fun, full visual sight of her brother's bungalow, number 17. And this gives Francis the comfort that when a camera is installed from number 17, that the shade is fully protected and the machinery is safe and doesn't have the issue of moving machinery in and out uh, as necessary to land the sheep for, for, for basically two months of the year. Uh, don't, don't forget, planning service have agreed that the buildings do integrate and meet the requirements of CT 13 and 14. So it's not an eyesore. It can't be seen. Uh, and it doesn't seem to have an issue with the neighbours. Health and safety does play a role in this. I do not accept that there's not been demonstrated or a letter of the 2nd of August 21 has attached to the block plan. It indicates levels from the yard at the back of the building or back of the dwelling number 16 to the very last shade at the top of the hill. The shades range over 30 metres frontage uh, and, and there's a rise of nearly 6 metres leaving a gradient of 1 in 5. Yes, granted, it has satisfied the farm till now but Francis and her brother or 60 years plus machinery machinery runs off hill unfortunately quite a bit it's an accident waiting to happen if you can compare this to a maximum gradient allowed for a public road in a housing development of one in ten i keep going there just a wee second you'll see the steepness of the the, the backbone there a wee bit more just a wee bit more a wee bit more oh gosh i may put the wrong but there's a view from the bottom see it right up to the very top and it shows the narrowness of the lane there. It shows the narrowness of the lane. Building F is a very back one. So you can imagine that's that's nearly five to six metres from the first shade to the, the very last shade. And we're asking, like, I, I drive farm machinery, uh, and I would have trouble backing a trailer and tractor up that to back it into a shade. Uh, uh, the photographs, and get, oh, sorry, in relation to the, uh, gosh, where am I now? Yeah, one in ten, which is steep. Sorry, that is a, a maximum gradient for a public road is one in ten within a housing development. This is twice as bad as a gradient of one in five. Furthermore, the access to these buildings is a mere eight meters wide in some of the cases. And that building D photograph, you can see it's only about three meters wide. Um, so you're so you're trying to back up a steep incline to put the machinery into a shade. You're also trying to direct the trailers into a relatively narrow door. To overcome this issue, it's the front half of each of these three shades were empty to allow Francis and her brother an opportunity to back the tractor and implement into the level floor. This would negate the current health and safety issues that exist. The small shade bulk will accommodate this requirement, i.e. the machineries will sit in that shade until they're required and only brought out. There's no maintenance in that shade. You can see from one of the photographs that uh, Martin showed, there was a small farm workshop that's ready to maintain the machinery. So that's there's no noise nuisance, no smell nuisance over at this new proposal. Um, 
So, so to build a further shape behind this is unreasonable in that we still have an issue with the steep drive. And as you drive further up, it's actually getting steeper. It's also, we're also creating another building now within the skyline. In relation to the access into the farmyard, planning service indicated that access had not been an issue for the preceding years. Again, has been issues over, the, we have discussed this in our letters. Large articles delivering hay and straw could not gain access to the farmyard. They returned to the yard again. A note the objectors submitted evidence to indicate that a lorry from surpluses could access. The access was only to the adjoining farmyard. They did not access or sick. The photographs show indicate that the lorry had very little clearance. And in fact, if they had continued on and into our yard, they would have extreme issues getting in. Bearing in mind, we don't own the hedgerows either side of the lane. Route, so no way of widening the lane. There's also a flood issue with the entrance uh, at number 16 and that the existing laneway into number 16 is floodable. In relation to the neighbour, and as Martin pointed out, look, there, there was number, I, th I think, number 13 had issues because of proximity to, to the shade. There's almost 70 metres to 75 metres between the side of our building and the back door of their house. Uh, and there's a clutter of small small shades behind it with a rough overgrown access sort of garden to the rear of that again before or or, or, or boundary. Uh, I, I, again, I, I, the nature of development, uh, i.e. machinery and hay storage, will not create a nuisance of smell odour. And EHD have confirmed they're happy. Financially, to buy a load of straw, hay or animal feed is always cheaper than subdividing or buying one or two bales at a time. There are financial hardships associated with this, never mind the time taken to collect these items. For example, a bale of straw last year, for example, was £65 a bale as part of a full load. It was eighty pounds uh, collected by Francis at the at, at the supplier's yard. The supplier obviously must store and move the bales two or three times before it gets to the farmer. So they, they need compensation for that. In relation to need planning services, stated that there's been no request to increase the sheep or indeed no evidence to buy cattle. We've not said anywhere that we intended to purchase more sheep, but merely the operational procedures Francis has to go through to lamb sheep for two months. This development will satisfy all of Francis's needs going forward. We did say, however, we may purchase cattle, but unlikely now as Francis is content with only sheep. Uh, we have demonstrated through this, this statement, and I think through the, the, the information I've already submitted, that we clearly comply with CTY 12. It is an essential and a necessity part of the building required for the overall concept of this farm, farm enterprise. And I think I've demonstrated health and safety grounds substantially and, and the financial hardship through this document currently before you. And brief synopsis on, on this application or this presentation. That's me finished. I've, I've nothing more to add. Uh, Martin, uh, and Chair, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, David, thank you very much. And now we have Councillor Wilson. Um, Councillors, have you any questions here? Hold on. Hold on, just, just one minute. I'm not seeing any. No. No questions. Okay, Bert. You have your five well, minutes. So. Uh, yes, uh, Chair. I, I put it in the site yesterday, and unless you were really on the site to see the uh, the situation that it is, you could not really uh, grasp the the problems that are there. Uh, you come in from the Derrabard Road to a very sharp right angle bend. And uh, there is somebody given measurements to do with it, but they don't realise that there's three large oak trees on that bend as well as uh, the uh, sharpness of it. Uh, the, to come in with a load of straw there it would be practically impossible. In fact, the council uh, lorry that uh, clears the septic tanks could not get in to do that job for they They had to send out a, a very small... Uh, vehicle that they have to, to uh, clear the septic tank, so uh, their lorry couldn't get in. So, And I know Johnny Donnelly, who would be supplying the stuff for whatever she needs to it, they have to bring the, the, the meal in in uh, four-stone bags rather than have to deliver it the way they normally would. Uh, as well as that, uh, the... the uh, when you, go, you do go in a bit, if you did get in, you have to turn immediately left up that. You, you've seen on the film there, the steepness of that hill. And it's unbelievable. And, and it's, if you weren't at the bottom of looking up, you wouldn't really believe it. And a good part of that is concrete as well. 
And uh, especially in winter time, you would not have a hope of getting if there was any ice or anything. You definitely wouldn't get up hardly with a tractor, never mind a, a, a lorry or, or other machinery. Uh, Francis uh, inherited the machinery from her father, who was an agricultural contractor uh, and a farmer. But she would inherit all that uh, machinery from uh, her father. And there's sentimental value in it as well as everything else. But she had another brother who unfortunately passed on and he would have been using that machinery as well. She still has a brother who works in a bakery but does help her out. And that is the house that we're talking about that the other sheds are attached to. So it's really it's really a family business. And uh, the lady, I can't say uh, what, uh, but she had been farming for a long, long, long time. And I can remember her father out contracting through, you know, the age that uh, she's trying to get do her work as best she can. Uh, the sheep and cattle that she would have had would have been in those sheds previously to the machinery being moved into them and taken over. The, that the, If she puts the machinery out, well, it's going to be destroyed in the rain and that, and that's the last thing she wants. So I would say this shed, I, I have no hesitation saying this shed is essential. It's really the only place that she can build. There was an indication in the schedule somewhere that she could widen that lane. That is impossible because the uh, left-hand side of that lane belongs to a different guy, and I'm sure the officer maybe would be aware of that, McConnell, who has a bungalow in there, and it goes right up the side of that lane, and it goes along the bottom of the lane as well, uh, McConnell's property. So th that that is not uh, something that's uh, feasible. Uh, she uh, she doesn't want to be uh, given any bother, but as I say, she does need uh, something that's more handy. She has to do quite a bit of the work herself now, and uh, her brother helps her when he's off work. But uh, to carry, she has to carry, as I say, the meal has to be carried into the sheds in four stone bags, and uh, that is not uh, simple at all. Uh, the uh, the proposed shed that we're talking about, and I'm sure the officer, I don't know, I know uh, Darren Lawther was out, uh, the, it's totally invisible. It's uh, up at the bottom, very bottom of a steep field, uh, which is surrounded by trees, uh, mature trees, I can say at that as well. It, it can't be seen from anywhere unless out of a helicopter, and that's not exaggerating. Uh, so I can't see that it's there. And the, f the uh, foundation for that house would have been in, a, 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 there was some mention of 2011. Uh, it's quite possible that it had been started then, uh, at the level the foundations and get it ready. So that is quite a while ago, and I would uh, uh, have no hesitation in asking the committee to take these things into account and uh, give this lady some comfort uh, in her farming. Yeah, Bert, if you draw to a conclusion. She, pardon? You are five minutes are up, Bert. So. Right. Well, she has, that's what she wants to do as far. Okay. Cheers. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Martin, have you any comments or? Yeah, th thank you. Um, I suppose a few a few comments of you know, in terms of development being being hidden and not being seen. Yes, we're not we're not we're not denying that, but that's that's only one of the policy tests. Um, I think it's important to to reflect on the policy in terms of CTY twelve. Um, we have an active holding. Um, we are meeting criteria A A to E. Um, and that's the initial test. So, so we're meeting all these um, um, features, um, but the policy makes it very clear that in in cases where there's a new building proposed, um, it, you know, it must you must provide sufficient information um, to demonstrate that there's no suitable existing farm buildings first and foremost to use. Um, that the, the design and the materials used and all of that are are considered acceptable. So. Through the report, I mean, we have we 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 are satisfied that 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 there is no suitable buildings, and that argument has been made that their at their storage capacity is full, so that's been accepted. Um, the design is fine. Um, 
But the critical point in this is that the proposal must be cited beside the existing farm businesses, farm buildings, um, if there's to be a new building proposed. Um, so if you can't meet that test, then we go on to the exceptions test. So there's another, there's another area for this to go to. Um, and the first part of that is that you must demonstrate that it is essential for the efficient functioning of your farm for a new building. So if you can't group beside your existing buildings and you want to go somewhere new, you must demonstrate that's essential. Um, now, we have support and information received, um, but I don't think it, it demonstrates to us that it's an exception. I mean, um, we have, through letters, have had some, some statements about potential expansion, cattle, a lot of that's aspirational. We have no verifiable plans. Now, we have heard today that there is no serious plans to expand. The plans are just to maintain. Um, if that is the case, there's no reason why the status quo can't continue. They're operating and have been operating out of this for years. They can continue to operate. Um, we have no expansion plans. The second part of the, of the exceptions test, um, as David alluded to, was um, you have to demonstrate health and safety issues as to why you cannot build um, a, a way you can build a farm building away from the existing cluster. Um, again, very, very similar. There has been no change in terms of the farming activity. There appears to be no change coming forward either, um, other than that it would make it handier for the, for the applicant to farm. Um, so for them reasons, um, you know, we don't think that they're enough to overcome the exceptions test. What I would say about the health and safety reasons is that that Darabar road is a very busy road. So if you're prepared to store your, your, your farm machinery on the far side of that road, there's potential health and safety implications for crossing that road um, that you don't have at the moment. So I think that's, that's really what I would like to conclude on, on what I've heard. Okay, thanks Martin. Okay, our first speaker then is John. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, obviously, we're, we're this is this is the second time that I've seen this one one here, and and obviously, the only thing that that, that I've heard is really different is the description of the lane. Now, we all know anybody who's involved in farming or agriculture will know that the margins are extremely squeezed now, with the, not only the costs of fuel but the cost of feed stuff and and fertilizers and stuff like that, and, and buying in bulk, in in biggest containers that you can buy it where it is less processed, saves you money. So if you can get your meal delivered in bulk, a couple of ton at a time, in a lorry that blows it into 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 a container, that saves you money. The same with your fertilizer, and it's again we heard feed stuff mentioned. And we've heard the only thing I've heard that has made it that sounds like an exception is the uh, the fact that these lorries can't go up the lane, and and they've only got a limited typeage for delivering this stuff. So would that be an exception? Or I mean, we've heard that the shed integrates. It's just whether it is required for this business, and if these bulk lorries can't deliver to the farm. It's going to make it financially unviable for for Francis to continue farming. The the way the squeeze is at the moment, because it's really is very very tight at the moment. The margins in farming. Okay. Okay. Um, in terms of bulk buying, yes, it has been mentioned. Um, but you have to consider that if 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 the shed that is proposed was to be used for that. That feedstock is going to be over 140 meters away from the principal farm buildings. So, you no, know, that in itself is a, is a serious issue. If, if there's an issue in terms of of being able to handle this, um, any 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 feed. So I'm not sure that sets as as an exception. I don't I don't I don't think it does. Um, think. The way the operation is being used at the moment is that the machinery is is removed from the buildings and sheep are moved into these in the certain times of the year. I mean, if that is the case, there's no reason why that can't continue. I think um, feed in bulk, 140 metres across the main road, 
I think that probably does demonstrate a health and safety issue. Okay, on. Sorry, I, it's just, I, I think maybe, I don't know if you come from a farming background, but you understand, but when I get meal delivered, I get tons of meal delivered, and then I break it up and put it into bags and drive it about in the back of my truck. If you want to go out and look, you'll, you'll find bits and pieces of it lying in the back of it now, and I'm sure other farmers are the same. And, and that's just, you know, you just don't have it at hand. At 140 metres of a distance isn't, I often walk up with a bucket on my arm, you know, with feed in it for, for animals. So it's breaking it up, but it's it's this essential saving of money. That's that's why I see, the, that's the only thing that I can see that's new here that, that I can see that is, is an issue. The rest of it, as you say, the sheds are there for lambing. The, the tractor has to be put out and left in the rain for two months, and it's, it's better inside. But this this margins at the cur currently in farm, and I see that as, as it makes a shed essential for storage of the food stuff delivered in bulk. Um, I suppose, you know, we have to get back to the policy and the essential, like, is it absolutely essential that this happens? I mean, we're not talking about a big farm op farming operation here. Um, this isn't big scale. You know, we have 70 so sh sheep or, 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 or in that region, and um, bulk buying probably isn't going to be the same as what it would be for a bigger farmer. You're not going to be blowing in meal for a year. Here, you know, it's it's not a big operation, so it has to be considered as well. So that's why whenever we're considering a new building, is it absolutely essential? I don't believe it meets that criteria. Okay, on. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, and I suppose just picking up on your queries there, Councillor McClary, and expanding on what Martin said. I suppose it, it's it's going back to um, look at that policy of essential and that requirement of uh, whether it's essential. Um, in terms of uh, efficient functioning of the business. Um, and there's no definition of essential, uh, but it's considered absolutely necessary. You know, that's the general meaning of it, absolutely necessary or extremely important. And I suppose in terms of looking at the information that's before us, you know, there, there's no proposals to expand the farm and the, the, the farm business has been operating in its current format for a significant period of time now. Um, so when you when you look at that type of information and that there's no new proposals coming forward to expand, um, looking at that essential you know element of the policy, then you know if, if the farm business has been um, continuing as it has and 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 existing for some time, then it, it it fails to meet that essential you know essential element of the policy. Okay. Alan. Well, thank you, Chair. I think that the recommendation uh, is fraught with uh, impracticalities. Uh, living on, on the farm, uh, uh, I have a lifetime of experience. I'll tell you the first thing that uh, has changed. Time is not on the side of the applicant. Time is taken away for the lady. She sees a great need. Uh, for for to upgrade uh, the uh, the uh, the buildings uh, that she requires uh, for to make her life somewhat practical. Uh, as it is, with the, the 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 shed that we saw, with the machinery in it, that's not machinery at all. That's a workshop. That's a workshop. No one in the right mind would uh, even believe or consider putting that out in the rain. They would need to get their head examined. They would need to, you know, uh, uh, it's ridiculous to even suggest it. That's a workshop which is uh, most important for, for, for anyone that has a, a, a selection of machinery. Now, she may not have purchased uh, the... the, the, the uh, the present big Ford tractor that I seen on that there, but that's one of today's uh, luxuries, uh, I suppose, in farming, and and uh, and it's absolutely uh, essential uh, because of the weather conditions and all. Whenever the, the uh, weather is uh, is uh, you know, favorable, you need to be able to get on with, with your work. 
uh, and those the machinery that she has uh, uh, that I saw in, in the slide there is vitally important. And so uh, it's really crazy in, in, in my mind that someone would be prevented from looking towards the future as to how she was, how she's going to operate. And uh, I agree with the, uh, the buying of the of the foodstuff or any other thing, uh, uh, hay and straw, and you couldn't uh, argue that that wasn't an essential for uh, the, the, the welfare of the animals in the winter time. And it's important that uh, that's able to be delivered to the farm. And I'm sorry that I'm a little terribly upright uh, right about this here, and I could go on for an hour of why the lady should be allowed. And this is not something that happened yesterday. I see evidence there of how long the, this has been on the pipeline, and the grass has grown up on the site. What a pile of nonsense. In my opinion, this lady deserves all all the all the support that we could give her, and uh, uh, I, I I leave it at this uh, for there at this stage. Sally, have we any other members that wish to comment? Okay, there doesn't seem to be any more comments, so I'm looking for a proposal and decision here, members. John? I, I'm going to go against the officer's recommendation and that I, I, I believe there's restrictions can be made to make it acceptable to the neighbours, but I think that this shed, with the way farming's going, that this shed is is essential for the business, and uh, so I'm going to go against the others and recommend that we uh, go against their recommendation and allow the shed to be built or finished. Okay, thanks, John. Glenn, thank you, Chairman. Well, <clears throat> um, we have heard the argument, and uh, I know that um, uh, there's. Uh, Running the farm business is fraught with challenge uh, at this time and has been for some time. Uh, but I do, um, in this instance, feel that the, the fact for me, the fact that the farm was operational and there aren't plans to expand, um, I do think that um, it, it errs towards convenience rather than being essential. And for that reason, I just don't feel that uh, I, I believe it would be better located closer to the existing buildings in this case. Um, and I don't think... Well, I don't feel that there was a a health and safety risk to having them uh, close, in my opinion. So I would support the officer's recommendation, Chairman, and propose the uh, propose the recommendation from the officers. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Lynn. Alan. Well, I want to uh, second Councillor McLaughlin's uh, uh, proposal that we go against the recommendation and that we uh, that we grant. Talent permission in this in this situation. Okay. Thanks, Alan. Okay, so I have the uh, proposal to go against the recommendation and to approve, proposed by John and seconded by Alan. Are we all in agreement, members? Bar uh, Glenn. Okay, so can we have a show of hands then? Okay, those in, in support? Six in support. Those against? Or against. Okay. Do we take it? Let's see. It's just for and against. Yep. Okay. So six for, 
or against. So uh, the Martin, if you'd okay. like to. Um, so the application was recommended for refusal um, for the reasons listed within the report and subject to two reasons. Um, so members have gone contrary to the recommendation and have granted plan of permission for this application. Um, so I need to ask for the powers to attach conditions um, if they could be delegated back to the planning staff. John's proposing and on a second. Yeah. That'll be including things like boundaries and access, etc. Okay, we all agreed. Okay, thank you, members, and uh, thank you to David and to um, Bert for uh, your contributions here. So we're going to move on now to. Point seven, and to note the schedule of planning decisions issued in June. That's paper C. This is just for noting members. So, <coughs> happy enough members to uh, to note uh, Earl. I propose note. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Chair Spurt, take care. And Josephine? Yes, I second that, Chair. Post to note. Okay, all agreed. Okay, we're moving on to eight then to note the update report on the planning enforcement in June. And that's paper D. Unless there's anything specific, it's pretty self explanatory there. So, proposed by Tommy, second by Earl. All agreed. Thank you, members. Moving on to nine. And that's considered a quarterly update on live planning caseload. And that is uh, paper E. And Paul is going to say a few words to that. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, and this is paper E, members. A quarterly update on the live planning caseload. Um, and just to note that the application submissions uh, they continue to be high, which is good. Um, workloads do continue to be challenging. Um, we're committing more staff to uh, the new portal for training and testing. Uh, but generally, there are positive signs in the report uh, that we're going the right direction uh, and the cases uh, and the case numbers are becoming more manageable. Um, overall, the, the caseload is reducing across uh, a lot of the time categories uh, within uh, PARA 2.6. Uh, and of particular note, um, we're now down to a case load of 527 applications. Uh, that's reduced from uh, 600 and, uh, 653 at the end of March, which is an 18% reduction, uh, and reduced from 716 in quarter one last year. Um, and again, that's a 26% reduction. Um, so uh, we're going the right direction, and, and the numbers will become more uh, manageable. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thanks, Paul. We have no speakers out, so I'm looking for a proposal to note. Uh, Tommy and Paul, thank you. Okay, moving on then to um, item number 10, consider planning performance annual statistical report for April 21 to March 22. And Paul's going to say a couple of words to this. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, members, uh, paper, paper F then. Um, it's an overview of uh, plan and performance for the year 21-22. Uh, it was published on 7th of July 2022. Um, I suppose just the, the headline figures. Um, unfortunately, uh, the Council has not met any of its uh, three statutory targets this year either. Um, and the details of the three statutory targets are set out there in paragraphs 2.7 to 2.9. Although uh, we do um, uh, perform well against the, the average across Northern Ireland, um, and members will be aware we've sort of commented on planning performance and uh, we're reviewing our own processes uh, within the team and, and regionally as well. Um, and, you know, the unvalidated stats for the last few months uh, was show us uh, starting to meet targets. So just to assure members that we're going in the right direction. Um, the, the publication notes that uh, performance was impacted by COVID-19 uh, and there was quite a uh, bit of downtime in the existing planning portal at the start of 22 as well, and that also impacted on performance. Some of our head, headline points in members, um, there's a 
1,157 applications received last year. That was 46, uh, an increase of 46 from the year before. Uh, 1,098 decisions were issued in the council, and that was an increase of 190 from last year. Um, and the FODC approval rate there is 97.7%, uh, which is higher than the NI average of 94.9%. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Robert? thought Earl was front, no? No. Um, it's still, I think if you uh, troll underneath the, um, the figures, you'll find, I think, that we are performing very well. One thing that is not really here referred to, and I think it's something that goes by the way, uh, we are dependent in the main with the majority of our applications um, from statutory consultees. And we have in the past had an issue with their responding time, which has impacted al also on our processing time. I think if you correlate the amount of approvals going through the system, uh, necessarily against the time taken to approve those or even process all the applications. I think you'll find, as referred to before, we tend in the committee to uh, sort of refer back some applications for further information. And quite often when that information goes back, either the application is withdrawn and resubmitted and it turns out to be an approval or the application, uh, once additional information has come in, is very much processed towards an approval rather than a refusal. So I think the good news coming out of this for the inhabitants of the area is that our officers perform well. And I think we as a committee, and I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, uh, do an inquisition on a lot of things that come up across us because we're looking for an answer that is correct. Now, that correct answer, in our opinion, may not always be what the applicant wants, but I think we have got to weigh up uh, the needs of our electorate, um, weigh it up against the policy framework that they're working within. So I think you as officers may take heart. What we would like to do as committee members is ensure that the statutory consultees, and we've plagued on about it before, perform better because they are the ones that are hindering in the main our performance. So thanks very much, Paul and Martin, for that update. Keep doing the good work, but if we think you're not doing the good work, we'll tell you. Okay, thanks. I think that was praise there, uh, Robert. Uh, um, Earl? Thank you again, Chair. Uh, as, as usual, Councillor Irvine's very enlightening comments. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to support all that he's said, actually, but uh, I'll propose the, the recommendation for Nodi. Okay. You, Chair. Cheers, Earl, and Robert seconding there. And we all agreed. Yeah, and just to, to add to it, from my point of view, also we had a discussion before the meeting about it, and um, while we see uh, improvements coming down the road, I think it's also very important to uh, have positive publicity out there. We are doing a good job. We are processing a lot of applications. We are processing a lot of applications through the delegated uh, process. And I think our officers are doing a tremendous job, uh, notwithstanding, as Robert and Earl has said, about the statutory consultees, and they are uh, a work in progress uh, at a higher level than ourselves to be able to get, I suppose, in the main resource into those uh, consultees' offices to be able to turn things around a little bit quicker to help with our uh, statistics. But uh, I think it's a joined up approach. I think we need to get that message out there. And, and I know Kim has undertaken to... Uh, uh, Encourage that that positive news story is uh, tried to get out on our social media as much as is humanly possible. Okay, we're moving on to uh, point 11, and that's to note the report on the non uh, determination appeals. And uh, that's for noting, uh, Paul. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, so, Paper G members is a report on non determination appeals in Northern Ireland. Um, it's not. It's not only the. It's not just the Fermanagh and Oma District Council area. 
uh, members had requested this detail at the at the May 22 meeting. Uh, the details are set out in Table 1. They've been taken from the Plan and Appeals Commission's annual report. And I suppose the, the, the key points, members, is that uh, non-determination appeals represents a very, very small element of the PAC casework. Um, and as a result of that uh, small, small workload, the success rate then varies greatly, um, I suppose, depending on uh, the site-specific cases of any appeal that comes before them. So thanks, Chair. Okay, I'm looking for proposal second to note, Paul and Robert. Uh, thank you. Okay, we have no correspondence. Oh, we have. Okay. Okay, members, we have uh, correspondence uh, from Donegal County Council, and it's a consultation in relation to their draft letter, Kenny plan, and local transport plan. Um, and members, uh, the LDP team is currently considering uh, the content of this. Uh, I would just point out that there's a reply date of the 5th of August. And I have sought an extension from Donegal County Council, uh, but unfortunately uh, that's been declined um, as a result of the statutory time limits associated with the consultation and their own wider deadlines for the project. So I was going to suggest if members were happy that uh, we would submit comments and bring them back before members for information only. Um, thanks, Chair. Okay, if we're happy with that, could I have a proposal and seconder, Anthony and Robert? All agreed. Chairs, members, thank you. Any urgent and relevant business? I haven't received any, so I'm going to take it that there's not. So I'm looking for a Paul, to propose we're going into uh, confidential business and Tommy to second. All agreed. Thank you. So we're going in then to uh, point.
Let's know when we're right. Okay. Chair, so during confidential business, members considered matters arising from the planning committee meeting on the 22nd of June and there were no matters arising. And members also considered and noted a report on the sustainable development uh, or disposal of waste from agricultural developments. OK, thank you very much. And that, OK, proposed by Earl and um, Josephine, thank you. Uh, that concludes our uh, meeting. Thank you all, uh, members and officers, uh, for your help and cooperation and enjoy the rest of your summer. Thank you.